So welcome everyone to the second part of Should I Be Writing? Taking that as an actual question, this time with a focus on actually doing some planning over the next three months. Uh, and um, yeah, I'm gonna jump right in. So a lot of today is going to be actually doing planning. Um, and so if you don't yet have your sort of calendar schedule book around that you will need that at some point, but I'm going to take you through a little bit of setup before we get there. So you have some time. Uh, all right, so I'll start sharing this PowerPoint. Um, all right. So the plan for today, for part two of our time, is uh, starting with this question of how did we get here? So how did we get wherever we currently actually really are um, in our writing? Then we're going to talk a little bit more about the problem of scale, which I mentioned last time. Um, thinking about habit as uh, what Olivia Octavia Butler called habit as persistence in practice. Um, and then we'll take a, a different view of schedules as a net for catching days. That's Annie Dillard's framing of it. But mostly what we're going to talk about today is thinking about process before product. Um, so, or process as something that makes products. So, how did we get here? Um, so I take it that Basically, um, there are various things that we do now. If you are here at a writing workshop, um, there's probably various things that you've done uh, that were helpful or that were a matter of survival for you or that worked somehow for you. And often those things don't actually help us now. And so one of the main things that I want us to start with is the idea that simply intensifying the things that we've done in the past isn't necessarily the way for us to um, get more ease and um, sense of capacity and, and workability with our own writing process. So on screen is a um, two panel section from Alison Bechtel's new memoir book, uh, The Secret to Superhuman Strength. Um, on the left panel is um, Bechtel's then girlfriend, Amy, sitting on a couch across from Bechtel, who's on the right hand panel. And the narrator says, it didn't take long for this pattern, Bechtel's pattern of staying up all night writing and then collapsing in exhaustion to become a point of contention. Amy tried to help me figure it out. And Amy's saying, what if you weren't always pushing yourself? What are you afraid would happen? And then the um, Bechdel says, ah, uh, the narrator says, this was an uncomfortable question. And then Bechdel says in frame, I, I wouldn't deserve to exist. Uh, in the background, Bill Clinton is on a TV screen and there's a little label that says, first democratic president in adult memory. A little bit later um, down that page, the narrator is a single, long single pane. And the narrator says, whatever pain or loss lay behind my erratic work habits was not as easy to pinpoint as some of the patterns with her father. In fact, deep down, I didn't think I had a problem. I wasn't some automaton punching in and out. I had to dredge stuff up out of nowhere to fill page after blank page. Of course, my existence hung in the balance. And behind those text boxes, there is a um, drawing of uh, Bechtel's studio and she's sitting on the far right with a cat looking peacefully out the window. And she's staring in a way that manages to convey itself as like tortured, grumpy, uh, self-critical at her drawing table. So one thing I want us to say is that um, Although last time we talked a lot about that quality of finding our motivation, finding why we're doing our writing, 
um, usually intensifying the existential demands of our writing in response to our experience of ordinary writing blocks doesn't actually help us very much. It usually doesn't work. Um, so uh, when I say existential demands of our writing, often I see this loop happen where people feel like um, it is uh, decadent and excremental to be in the university, for example, many of you are university writers, um, and therefore you should feel shame about even having any torture about writing at all. But at the same time, you're because your writing is useless and you know not related to the people or movements or anything relevant. But at the same time, it's like an incredible privilege and you have this time and space. So you should be having a really good time writing and it's very easy um, or, you know, anytime basically where your existence comes to hang in the balance, but at the same time you have a loop of fear, obligation and guilt. Uh, I haven't seen that work very well for most people. So I think there's this alternative suggestion, which if you are interested in Alison Bechtel, I do recommend reading The Secret of Superhuman Strength. Um, but I also really love this book um, by Ali Brosh called Solutions and Other Problems. And the last uh, section of this, which is an, another comic memoir, um, is sort of after Ali Broche has just kind of like devastated her entire life. And, um, and it's a section on becoming friendly to herself, like actually becoming friends with herself. In the Buddhist community that I've practiced in for most of my life, there's a kind of catchphrase that the meditator is someone who is friendly to themselves and merciful toward others. And I also recommend you just read this last short piece in that Broche book if you have time because it's incredibly moving. Um, so there's four panels and in one is, it's both Ali Broche talking to Ali Broche and in one, Ali Broche in a red shirt is saying, so what do you like to, in the next panel, um, she's saying, do. And then there's Ali Broche in a kind of like yellow jumpsuit looking kind of grumpy saying nothing. And then there's first Ali Broche saying, or maybe do you want to like, tell me a little bit about yourself? So I like this model of asking what actually would it take for us to be friendly to ourselves as writers, to become friendly with our own writing process and with the parts of ourselves that um, I think for good reasons get blocked and resist and want to do something else. And so the three kind of um, frameworks that I want to suggest to you are cultivating a sense of play and curiosity about ourselves not giving up on ourselves, even if we might be a little bit pathetic, and having a practice of steadiness. Um, and I'll say more about all of those. So just to go back to something we talked about last time, um, to think about the problem of scale. So I said last time that motivations, either extrinsic or intrinsic, are um, too big to help us when we despair. So they're the, they're the wrong scale. And then the, the points in time where we leave our writing practice, what I'm talking about is off ramps, are pretty small. Um, they're really easy to miss. Like we, our experiences that we kind of just um, suddenly, we don't even know what happened, but we're somewhere else playing, um, you know, a game on our phone or doing something else. We're like, well, how did I get here? I was just gonna start writing. So most of what we're talking about today is this possibility that we could have practices which are um, in the middle of that scale and which help us. Uh, the image here is a picture of N.K. Jemison's fist um, and written across her palm that's visible below her knuckles is the word persist in red pen. Um, that's her writing advice, persist. So the question is how? Octavia Butler, um, there's a picture of a black woman in her late 40s smiling kind of ruefully in front of some green foliage with a colorful jacket and a purple turtleneck. 
she said in her writing advice, um, which is in the collected stories called Blood Child, she says, first, forget inspiration. Habit is more dependable. Habit will sustain you whether you're inspired or not. Habit will help you finish and polish your stories. Inspiration won't. Habit is persistence in practice. So habit, um, one way that people cultivate habits or think about them differently is as schedules. And one question we can consider is whether a habit for us is different than a schedule and which thing makes us have that kind of reactive oppositional response. So Annie Dillard, this is widely quoted, um, writes, how we spend our days is of course how we spend our lives. What we do with this hour and that one is what we are doing. A schedule defends from chaos and whim. It is a net for catching days. It is a scaffolding on which a worker can stand and labor with both hands at sections of time. So habits, schedules, catch our time. So I'd like us to start um, with uh, these two questions. Um, what are your actual writing habits? I rephrased that question as no like for real. What do you actually do? And then how is that going for you? So what I'm going to do is to, um, just as we did last time, and so for folks who weren't here, I'm gonna open an optional breakout room. So your choice here is to go into a breakout room and talk with other people. And what I'd suggest is um, if you get more than sort of like five people in a breakout room, go into a different one with a smaller group so that you can actually have a conversation. Or if you um, don't wanna to talk to people, that's totally fine. You just stay here and um, really sit and contemplate so before we do this, let's just take one minute of actually um, grounding a little bit because this is, can feel like a kind of scary set of questions. So wherever you are, if you can just um, feel your body for a minute. So feel to the edges of your skin, feel your um, length from where you're grounded on the earth to where you extend into the sky, it's the space of your own dignity. You could feel your width. So how much room do you take up side to side and your depth? So a feeling that you're three-dimensional. And just in your space, notice three things that you see. Notice Three things that you feel with your body. If you're not feeling much, you can move your hands against your legs or touch something on your desk. Notice maybe three things that you can hear with your ears. So sensory grounding is something that when we're confronting a potentially scary task or question, we can always do that. Um, it's available to us to be in our body. And one of the things that I think is the case is that um, sensory perception cuts concept. So especially when we're getting a little spun out, um, grounding can be helpful. And not necessarily grounding inside, right? Grounding in that connection that we have to the world. All right, so you're going to, if you want to go into a breakout room, go into a breakout room and talk about what your actual writing practices are and how they're going for us. And I'd like you to do this as though you were talking about a friend who had some um, patterns that you could perceive very clearly and you still love them. 
So please don't be like, I am the shittiest person ever. Any questions before we do this? So this is going to be for, um, let's do this for 10 minutes. Um, so actually really like let yourself drift, let yourself think. If you're talking, just listen, then, you know, see what it sparks for you. Um, it's also okay if you want to um, reflect for a little while and then go into a room, that's fine. So we'll do this until half past. And opening the rooms, I'm going to pause the recording. So are there any questions that came up in that or reports from that space that you want to bring into the shared room? I, I like one of the members of the group had said the regular practice of going to the library to the favorite table all mm -hmm. blown up because of the pandemic. Mm -hmm. So it's just sort of like not not quite there. And yeah, and it's an off ramp, but I think it's a, it's a very realistic one. It's being kind to yourself. You were saying that, that, well, you know, I don't know. Maybe you need to put a little coffee cup and the music on that you usually listen to or something. I don't yeah. know from the coffee from the coffee shop. But I, I thought that was a real good point. Yeah, I think that's an excellent point. I think one of the things when we're looking at this year is that many of the things we um, used to do are disrupted massively. Um, Lisa says, I think a lot of writing advice presupposes that the writer is able-bodied and healthy and financially stable, and I am none of those things, so I need to remember this and factor that into the mix, the fact that I have some parameters that need some kindness. Yeah, and lots of nods and yesing to that, yeah. Claire says, I realize that several of my habits, some of which are commonly considered good writing habits, aren't working very well for me right now. Emily says having some sort of structure was a recurring theme across our discussion. So Emily, that was, people said that they do have structure in their writing or they wish they had structure in their writing. I think it was much more of a, this is something that we recognize as helpful, uh -huh. um, but that we don't always have. Okay. Um, and I know that it came up the distinction between having a sort of healthy, supportive structure and the sort of pressure that comes from deadlines yeah. um, as two different sort of motivating factors, but one being much more um, unkind than the others sometimes. Yeah. Thank you. Ajay? I, I've observed in the last couple of years that it really depends on what kind of writing I'm trying to do because it doesn't, you know, like working on a shortish article or an op-ed or, you know, a book length project, uh, I, mm -hmm. it took me by surprise. I thought I could use the same strategies for all and I really can't. Yeah. Uh, and and uh, do you want to say something about what the different strategies are when you actually are doing them, how they differ? Yeah. Yeah. So I've, I found um, really, I mean, writing books just seems like, I mean, I've not yet written a book. I'm in the process of uh, working on a couple and, and it, that just feels like torture because mm -hmm. it's just so difficult to uh, uh, try and carve out like a, what the approach that I've been trying to do is to carve out large blocks of time. Mm -hmm. But, you know, with work demands, pandemic demands, but I think in my case, most importantly, parental demands, because mm -hmm. I have, a, you know, a two year old, um, it's just not a practical way to work. And it yeah. takes the joy out of work because then, you know, like it's not, and it's a strategy that I used to use when I was without child that mm -hmm. worked really well because then it didn't matter as much. But I realized in hindsight, it was putting a tremendous amount of strain on my personal relationships as well as my body, yeah. uh, which are two big taxes that I'm trying to kind of like, I don't know, recoup from yeah. in developing better strategies and practices. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's really important. Um, Jane says, I have enough structures and habits to keep churning out writing on a regular basis, but no idea how to finish anything without the panic, anxiety, rush, stress, big stick of external deadlines. And lots of nodding and agreeing there. Yeah. 
Um, and Sarah notes, feelings of overwhelm and panic make me more likely to take the off ramps, um, which is a profoundly self-protective approach, right? There's wisdom there that um, if the thing that is causing you, so in my case, like I've had various, um, you know, ulcers and different um, chemical reaction stuff that gets really bad when I work in a particular mode and many of us will have our own versions. So it's a really protective thing for your body mind to just be like, fuck this, I'm out. Um, Rachel says, I found it very helpful having CRIP disabled colleagues, fellow students to write with and commiserate with. We can set up structures to help motivate ourselves, each other to write, but also find ways to incorporate CRIP time. For example, if there's stormy weather coming and all of us are in pain flares, we adjust our schedule without guilt and provide tangible support, sharing advice on how to balance painkillers that cause brain fog with writing, for example. Um, Katie affirms what Ajaya is saying about having different kinds of projects, co-authored, solo, authored, deadline, no deadline, philosophical, quantitative, and strategies that work for one often don't work for the other. Um, and, and I think um, I wanna like highlight the, uh, what Alice and Ajay both are saying about the space of being with family. If you, if being able to go away, you know, be in a cafe, what that feels like as different from being writing with your kids there, with your family there, even if you have headphones on. Um, Brie notes that I, they can be much more, she can be much more productive writing collaboratively, conference panel proposals and so on. But now that I'm working on my dissertation, that collaborative element is just gone. I try to work it back in through writing center appointments and talking to my advisor, but it's still very lonely and I'm not working well alone. Yeah, thank you all for sharing these things. It's really important that we actually get sort of a little bit of that sense. Um, and, uh, and I think um, one of the ways that I feel like I'm coming to see that writing advice has to be extremely, um, like almost insultingly particular, not just to us, but to us in the particular moment we're in with the particular body and mind that we have in the, in the configuration that we're actually in. Um, and that's what I'm really interested in us beginning to develop some um, practices around. So I'll um, go back and share just a couple of other things, then we'll take a break and then we're just gonna be entirely in planning mode for the rest of the time. But I just wanna throw a few more quotes at you and I, Hope everyone's okay with that. And if you're not, you can, I won't be offended. Just go, you know, play a game for a little bit and then come back uh, at like 10 to you. All right, so here is back to our PowerPoint. So one claim that I'm gonna offer, and I, again, I think we need to be reading all of these as though they might be right, but they might not, right? So resisting dogmatism in writing um, advice or practice and having an attitude of exploration, I think is helpful and useful for us. But I feel pretty good about this claim that process makes product. So this also comes from that book, Art and Fear uh, from Bales and Orland. And they say, what got you here? What I think it said what you did got you here. And if you apply the same methods again, you will likely get the same result again. This is true, not just for being stuck, but for all other artistic states as well, including highly productive states. As a practical matter, ideas and methods that work usually continue to work. If you were working smoothly and now are stuck, chances are you unnecessarily altered some approach that was already working perfectly well. When things go haywire, your best opening strategy might be to return very carefully and consciously to the habits and practices in play the last time you felt good about your work. And I'm gonna critique this in a minute, but I, I'm giving you the parts that I think are 
useful and provocative here. So they say, the discovery of useful forms is precious. Once found, they should never be abandoned for trivial reasons. Only the maker, and then only with time, has a chance of knowing how important small conventions and rituals are in the practice of staying at work. The hardest part of art making is living your life in such a way that your work gets done over and over. And that means, among other things, finding a host of practices that are just plain useful. So I think the parts for me that feel very useful about this idea um, is this sense that if we keep doing the thing that we've done, um, and I'm talking here less about many of those actual practices that I was just um, having you think with, and more about the way that we talk to ourselves or the way that we think about our writing. Um, that if we keep doing the same thing we've done, we probably will have the same effect that we're having. So if we're stuck or we're hurting ourselves in our writing practice, or we're hurting our relationships, or we require an enormous injection of cortisol and stress to get something finished, chances are we're not gonna suddenly transition into a um, steady, easeful, joyful form of writing, even when the writing is hard. Um, but the thing that this sense um, or this frame that they're giving us misses is this part when they say, if you are working smoothly and are now stuck, chances are you unnecessarily altered some approach that was already working perfectly well. So like I maybe elaborated too much last time, many of us won't have a practice of um, working that feels good that we can return to and the world and our circumstance changes around us. So it's not good for us to have the sense that um, the only way we can write is if we become a different version of ourselves and, and most of us might not want to, right? To not have the kids, you know, or the family or the life that we have. So we might not be able to, we might not want to. Uh, it might be the wrong kind of life. It might be a cruel form. Academia, I think, usually is. So having a sense of um, orienting toward the idea that we can find an ongoing practice that we may never have yet known that will allow us to do the things that we want to do uh, is helpful. Um, so the three kind of frameworks that I'm finding useful for this are um, taking a general orientation of play and curiosity, but serious play and real curiosity. Um, so experimenting with what's working and beginning to tune into how you might know that. So especially if you've been very cruel to yourself as a writer, um, because you internalized the language and demands of the neoliberal, capitalist, colonial, racist, sexist, ableist academy, you might need to be as tentative with that friend making as Ali Broche was in that set of um, that comic. Like, it might be really slow. And you might need to find a way to give yourself the authority to assess whether something you're doing is working for you. So I'm using here this shorthand of your best self, which basically is the self where you are kindest to yourself, softest, and also most implacable in believing that you can do wonderful things. And um, that you have a particular, unique, specific offering that no one else has, and that 
it's useful to offer that. It's good to offer that. So that's the sort of technical meaning of best self here. So taking yourself as unique and as ordinary and therefore connected to other people who are interested in knowing what you're thinking about and writing about. The second part is taking this attitude of um, not giving up on ourselves, even when we may be a little bit pathetic or self sabotage or um, whatever your particular kind of diminishing narrative is. And the mode that I think of for that, um, my friend Marissa Lingen says that often when she's um, feeling really frustrated with herself, she'll say, what's wrong with you? Why can't you do this? And then she changes it and she says, no, what's, what's wrong? Why can't you do this? Right, like that's this quality of like, it's not because you're fundamentally um, impossible or useless. It's maybe like we need to find out what's happening and not start with this narrative of the idealized academic who never really existed, right? Who was incredibly parasitic on people, but instead turn toward the interdependent academic who is able to offer care and support and able to receive it. So not believing your sort of diminishing or demeaning narratives, um, refusing to give up on yourself as a writer. Um, and then steadiness. So this is uh, a relationship where if you keep showing up and doing the things that help the work, you'll end up making things with a joyful effort. Steadiness here doesn't mean that you have to always work. It might mean that there are times where you shouldn't work and you need to stop um, where it's not possible. I think though, one of the reasons that I, I'm here and that maybe many of you are here is um, I get great joy in writing and thinking and reading what other people are thinking and writing and talking to them. Um, it's one of the best things. And I think that it's liberatory. I think it's worth our time. It's worth our lives. So, um, and I think people have done this kind of work um, in an incredible range of situations. So I think we can, but we're not gonna do it out of cruelty. Okay, so we're gonna come back after a break and I'm gonna be asking you to, to do a reflection or a writing on um, these questions about what you want to make over the next five years, over the next year. And we'll spend most of the time talking about what you're interested in doing over the next three months. And I'm also going to ask you to um, write down a little bit or mark a little bit how you'll know when you've completed the work. So let's um, take a break to move and maybe hydrate or pee. Um, and uh, we'll come back at five to the hour. So we'll take about seven minutes. Okay. I'm resuming. Okay, so I'll, I wanna just open before we go into hard planning mode with um, this question from Emily that is really good that I didn't see, which is, can you say a little bit more about not taking anyone else as authority, especially in situations where there are others who idea, whose ideas you need to meet the criteria of to finish writing? This is an excellent question. So, um, we talked last time about the difference between intrinsic motivations and external motivations, partially in terms of credentialing. So one of the things that's very useful for us to be able to identify and be kind of clear eyed about is when uh, there is something that we need to do in order to get through a particular gate and there are gatekeepers. And so that there's a whole array of what those things are. So if it's a particular journal, there's probably forms or a whole conversation that you have to reference that actually you think is irrelevant and useless. If it's a dissertation or an MA committee, 
you know, you might have someone on your committee who really requires you to cite them and they will be shameless about not passing you unless you have cited them. Um, or they might require you to demonstrate your facility with a theorist who is actually irrelevant to your own work, but who is really central to their work. So when I talk about finding your own best authority, I mean it in two different ways. One is that you identify those external authority imperatives. And when you meet them, you do it as yourself. So you allow yourself to say, I am citing this theorist who is irrelevant actually to my, what I've discovered my work is, but I need to be able to show that I'm in conversation with them in order to be in conversation with this person who is a gatekeeper in my life. And that doesn't have to be that you're like selling your soul or something. It's that you're demonstrating that capacity and you're doing it on purpose agent agentfully. So being your own authority is, um, there's a book called Unfuck Your Boundaries that I think is pretty useful. And it's like, there are times where we are, our boundaries are being violated um, and we decide to stay in the situation for good reasons or reasons that we choose. Um, and one of the things that's interesting there is if you say, I'm going to stay in the situation, although I feel that this person is abusing their authority and requiring me to cite them, but I want to get this PhD. That feels existentially different than trying to convince yourself that you actually personally care about the theorist that you're being required to cite. So is that part clear about the um, that part of authority making? Yeah, it's about survival, as Lisa says. The second part though is, and this is the more important part for us today. There are so many people who have advice for you. And it's like I said last time, they'll have the advice, they'll give you the advice as though it's the best possible advice. And it might be the best possible advice for them. So the reason that I like that part from art and fear about um, saying only the maker knows how important small conventions and rituals are in the practice of staying at work. So this is that sense of like, the difference between stopping our writing is that we can start our writing again. So the only thing Bales and Orlin say, the only thing that happens when someone quits making their work is that they don't start again. So it's just to say, you can be your own authority on what allows you to start. And if someone sets themselves up as an authority on your writing process, your creative process, which people definitely have, that's the thing about being shaped in schooling. People definitely told you the way you write is you have to do an outline and then an extended outline and then an annotated bibliography. And that is how you write. You know, like you've had layers of authority put on you about how to write and they've been your practices and your habits, but those might not be how you actually do your work. So this is the creative part of like, you might have to find ways of doing your work that you haven't yet done. And that means taking that approach of experimenting. So read lots of self-help books about writing, read lots of blogs, but be your own best authority and have measures that are um, coming from you. I think good measures are, does this approach make you suffer terribly? Is it reliant on being an internalizing authoritarianism and being very demeaning and horrible to yourself? Do you get ulcers? Like, um, does it deepen the systemic injustice that you're subjected to? Like, those are some of the external markers that can cue you if it's not good advice for you. The other thing I'll say about this, especially when you're in a position of um, being on, um, trying to get a tenure track job, trying to finish a dissertation, trying to finish an MA, I believe that writing doesn't have to be um, awful and hurt us. But mo many people have experienced that writing had to be awful and hurt them. And they think that if you don't demonstrate enough pain, you haven't actually done um, 
your work. So my dissertation supervisor, who was actually a total sweetie who mostly just kind of benignly neglected me and related to me like a mountain goat who didn't need any care or help, um, which wasn't actually the best thing for me. Uh, as I was getting toward the end, he said, you know, I think your dissertation's pretty much done, but I'm just not sure that you've actually suffered enough to get the PhD. And he was kind of joking, but he really wasn't joking. And after he said that, I started to be a lot more loud about what a hard time I was having and how everything was really difficult. And kind of once I demonstrated that I was suffering, um, things moved faster. So that's just to say, I want you to have a super easy time writing, but you might need to perform that you're having a really difficult time. But do that up, right? Like show that to authorities who are evaluating, assessing you to your peers and to people who are coming up that you're mentoring, model the possibility that writing doesn't have to destroy you. So have lateral relations of solidarity with each other, support each other in taking time off, in having ends to your work days, in taking weekends, in joining labor unions, like be good to each other. So have lateral relations and relations where you're supporting people coming up. Um, where you don't demonstrate that you're like the hardest worker and the most pained person. Thanks for that question. Okay, uh, so we're gonna do this kind of fast and I want to do this on purpose kind of fast because I want you to not actually think about it that much. So be like a little bit extravagant as you're sitting and thinking about these things. So we're gonna do this for just five minutes. I think this time we won't go into breakout rooms. Um, so just um, sit and think and take notes uh, about these questions. So what do you want to make? Um, so in five years, when you look back, what do you want to have finished? Over the next year, what do you want to have finished? Um, and then we'll mostly be talking about over the next three months. Um, but if you can say, how will you know that you have completed that work? Okay, so um, starting now. So if you haven't already switched to thinking about what you want to have done a year from now, 
So in, you know, May 31st, 2022, turn to that. And then over the next two, three months, uh, only two things. No more than two things and no more than 60 pages. No more than 60 new pages. I see various people getting panicky looks in their eyes. So Tracy, I will allow a revision plus 60 new pages. One revision, 60 new pages. Okay, so turning to your calendar now, uh, what time are you going to take off over the next three months? So I would like you to actually look at your calendar and um, set um, ideally a week a month that you're taking off your work. I know. So if you can't do that, I'd like you to have at least one four or five day weekend each month. And I'm going to make a very strong suggestion that over the next three months, you try to respect weekends. Uh, and here are some of the only places that I get truly dogmatic. You have to take at least one day off and you have to have an end to your work day. So get out your calendar. So if you're coming off of a term right now, many of us are, I would suggest that you take, say, the week of June 7th off, or possibly next week off. What is a weekend? It says, you know, in a, you know you're in a cruel cycle when someone tells you you have to take weekends off and your stomach drops with anxiety. Okay, so Katie says, can we sum that up? So partly this is around, um, if you're in a union, 
you have a certain number of days that you're supposed to take off. And as a matter of respect to the workers who fought and died for you to have time off, you should take that amount of time off. For many people who have full-time jobs, that's four months, four weeks. <laughs> it's not four months, it's a month. Um, if you're a precarious worker, you're someone who is doing academic work on the side, you're writing and you're doing other kinds of labor. I know that this isn't gonna be like your, so you can also think about this as time when you don't feel guilty for not writing. Uh, Alice notes, it's hard to say until we know more about camps and childcare reopening announcements. So in that case, I want you to have an if then statement, right? So if, if this camp opens, then I'm taking this time. And what I'd like you to notice is um, just because you have childcare doesn't mean that that's a work week for you. So if you have childcare if kids are at camp, that might be the time when you're taking that week off. So this is about actually taking, building rest in to your summer, in this case. I don't know when everyone's watching this, but. Um, ah, Alana says, I'm probably not alone here. I was forced to take most of last week off because I got end of term sick. That does not count as time off. That is difficult time when you're not working, but you're sick. So being sick isn't a break. It's working hard to heal and mend. Um, so this is for you, what does time off mean? And that's what I'm asking you to think about taking. So if you're teaching this summer, it might be that you can't have multiple, you know, whole week off because you're teaching every week. So then what are the times where you're not working? Um, where you're not working on your teaching, where you're not working on your writing. How are you gonna build that in? Yes, and the point here is not to feel guilty for not writing. So to have some fixed times where you're not guilty for not writing and um, you're, uh, you're not, yeah. And I know that for many people, this is like, as soon as you have childcare, you wanna be writing. And I maybe am belaboring this point too much. You're really tired. It's, this has been the hardest year. So you deserve some ease and some rest. Planning to work half days uh, does not count. And only working three to four hours a day doesn't count because three to four hours of writing is the most that anyone can do anyway. Um, and when I say off, I mean off of everything, actually, ideally. So off of anything that feels to you like work. So that means administrative work, emailing, um, reading. Uh, so um, yes. Okay. Uh, Erin says, do you have any advice on navigating scheduling and disability? Because flare-ups can be unpredictable. I often try to work as hard as possible when I feel healthy, knowing that a time will eventually come when I can't work later. So I think unknowability impacts scheduling for me a lot. And I'm sure I'm not alone in this. I think you're definitely not alone in this. So one of the things that I'm really interested in thinking about is recognizing when the, our patterns of work produce um, more suffering for us. For many of us, and I'm saying this, and it is not to say you're working and therefore your disability flares or you're working and therefore your pain flares. But um, I gave you the sort of guilt trip version. Um, I'll just come back so I feel a little bit less, less like we're just talking to a PowerPoint screen. I gave you the guilt trip version of people fighting and dying for you to take breaks and not work yourself to death. And that works really well for me because I'm very guilt motivated. The other thing that um, is true is that in order to be a functioning system that is um, per perpetuates itself, uh, 
we can't always be redlining. And so I'm, I'm kind of just speaking from my own experience of when my chemical sensitivities flare and then I get into sort of three days of brain fog and I can't talk or think or read. Um, and for me, what I've noticed is that those are much worse when I've been redlining myself for days and weeks. So a lot of this like building and rest and breaks is um, trying to take seriously the idea that it's actually not effective or functional for us to push ourselves to go at our limit until we break down. Um, and that um, we can be a little bit more deliberate about what the things are that really have to happen. But I know that this doesn't, it's not easy. Like I'm not saying any of this is easy. And, uh, but what I can say is that I would like you to experiment with it and see, like I'm, I. this is a thing that I am dogmatic about, but I might be wrong, right? This might not be right for you. But if you've been trying the things that you've been trying for a really long time and you are suffering a lot, maybe try this for a month or for a week. See what it looks like, see whether it counted. Okay, we're, we have 12 minutes left. Um, so we're gonna experiment with uh, being like, raising things and not necessarily being able to work them all through. But what Katie um, says, yeah, so we're gonna come back into this question of daily writing. So Katie notes, when you count up how much time you actually have, uh, it ends up being that you don't actually have a lot for writing. So let's talk about sort of process stuff. So, um, This question is, how can you have infrastructure supports that help the practices that you're setting up? Um, and uh, so you've identified things that are off ramps for you that are, um, or that are hurtful to you. So what are the things that you can do that um, automate or don't require you to have heroic acts of will in order to get through them? So um, these can be, if you know that you start writing anxiety flares and you go toward um, that sort of like scratching an itch even though you're bleeding um, habit or you know whatever that is for you, that you have a list of the websites that you go to. So if you know that like you go and scroll through the feed of someone who goes to you, um, put that website on an internet blocker so that when you start writing, you just can't do that. Or give yourself a timer where you say, I can scroll the feed of the person who ghosted me for 10 minutes. Um, I can research the medical procedure that I'm anxious about for five minutes. I can do my looping for this amount of time and then I do this other thing. So this can be social spaces. So one day we will be able to write together in cafes and libraries again, but it can be doing um, work together over the internet. Um, it can be having a phone call where you say, okay, I'll talk to you in a little bit of time. So what I'm suggesting for uh, the kind of dailiness is either units of time or numbers of words. So units of time, I suggest 45 minutes, many people like 20 minutes, pomelo, pomelo style, where success is just that you showed up and did that. Um, numbers of words is you decide a number of words that you're gonna do for any of your work days. Some people need to write every day, right? The advice to take a day off doesn't help them at all. Um, yeah, Chris Dixon writes in, is a rebel and writes in 50 minute units. Um, the thing that I like about units of time is that it doesn't matter how much you got done 
it just matters. Did you show up to your work? And did you do something, even just sit there? As long as you weren't literally scrolling through the feed of someone who ghosted you or doing the other thing that is like the dog looking out the window to figure out who's gonna walk by so that they can anxiously bark at them, whatever you didn't do that's that equivalent thing for you is a success. If you're able to write 200 words and as long as they're words, even if they're terrible, you feel good, that's also fine. But to have the unit of, um, the unit of practice be different than anything that you could assess as, is this good, does this suck? That's my main suggestion there. And then have some infrastructure practice for that. For revising um, existing words, same thing. So when you're, you're just like, I'm gonna put in one unit today on um, revisions. And as long as I've opened the document and read it, um, and I'll send around when I send the recording a little thing about impossible, the impossible task exercise, because we don't have time to go into it. Um, let me just check to see what I've missed in the chat that is. Uh, yeah. So Rachel says, um, the guilt doesn't come from feeling guilty about lack of productivity because down with capitalism, yes. I don't work at all after 4 p.m. or in weekends, and in the summer, weekends are at least three days. But I do often feel some guilt about the idea that I only have that freedom because of my privilege, no dependence. I have enough funding that I don't need to work several jobs on top of school, et cetera. So that's a really um, important point. And spend some time thinking through what works for you to think about that. For me, when I work through that, um, I think two things. The first thing is what I actually want in this world is for everyone to have enough time to do the work they want to do. Um, like it kills me that the world is such that um, it's so brutal. Uh, so that me having that doesn't mean that I don't want that for everyone. Um, and then I really think that we need to have political practices outside of our academic or writing work that actively work toward building that world. Um, so wishing for others to have the time and space to do writing and then um, having an actual political collective practice where you're working on that in whatever you're connected to, those are the two ways that have helped me a lot, just personally. Um, Okay, just one more point here. So to just be thinking about what are your evaluation points? So when you look at whether the experiments you're doing are working, how, how will you assess whether it's working? So what are the markers for you of whether the writing practice that you have is helping you or hurting you? Um, so like for me, that is, am I um, talking to myself in really shitty and demeaning ways? Am I triggering brain fog days for myself? Am I having a lot of days in any given week where I'm awake for three hours in the night fretting? Although literally I do not have children or even pets. Like I only have one sort of like slightly scary plant in my bedroom, right? So if I'm having that, there's something that I'm doing in my daily practice that isn't working for me. So you have your own way to evaluate that. Um, so the, the places of, of evaluation are, am I, am I setting up practices that allow me to do the things that I wanna do? So in my case, that's writing no more than three units a day, taking weekends off. If I start to feel like I have to work seven days a week, what's gone wrong there? How, you know, I know that working more isn't gonna make me work better, What's happening? You know, if I'm having lots of insomnia, what's happening? What's going on? So asking yourself how you'll experiment and how you'll assess without losing or discrediting what you've learned um, and turning toward the things that are working for you is a, a relevant task. Okay, we have just a short time, too short a time. Um, 
and I'm happy to stay on a little bit longer and sort of just talk through things. Uh, I'll record this. And so if you need to go in four minutes, um, that's fine. So we have a we have two ways we can do this. We can stay all together. I can give you four minutes of being in breakout rooms and then we end. Uh, do you have any preferences or desires? Let's stay together, people are saying. Okay. Anything to say about these completion markers in the last reflection? Yeah, I find I don't know when it's done other than sending it out. Okay, so um, one of the things that we haven't talked about much in terms of completion markers is another technique that I um, have really appreciated and that I try to use, which is having a memo that you sh use when you're sharing something with your committee or your writing group, your friend who's reading your work before it goes out. And this is a space where you say, um, dear person who's agreed to read this, so dear you know, doctor supervisor, dear friend who's agreed to read this, here is a certain number of words or pages. It is a first draft of this paper or this chapter. What I'm trying to do in this is argue, explain, explore, so that you actually say what you're trying to do, which allows the person reading it to say, I know you said you were trying to make an argument, but what I actually saw here was a really um, great explanation of the literature that you're interested in. So this is what I'm trying to do. I would be interested in your feedback on these three things. So if it's a first draft, I would be interested in your feedback on the overarching arc of the piece. If it's a final draft and you're writing to a committee member, you say, I am only interested in sentence level feedback at this point. And often you can say, if it's an authority figure, you have already read and responded to two drafts of this. Here are the changes I've made. So you begin to build in your own, um, your own way of saying what you're trying to do. And that corrals, especially committees, to be able to respond to what you actually are asking them to respond to. Because otherwise, as you know, academics are just like goats and they just kind of nosh around on what they're interested in, which might not be what you're working on. And yeah, if folks want to share how they set endpoints and assessment points, that would be very helpful. Um, Mary says, I write a prompt after I read an article relevant to some part of the new book. So completion markers sometimes are given to us by the thing that's assigned. So if you're writing a longer piece, um, it's useful to look at what the norm is in your field. So that could be in the journal that you're submitting to. It could be looking at what dissertations in your department have been um, accepted. How many chapters did they have? Did they have a methodology section? Did they have a, you know, what did they do? So if what you're trying to do is meet the, can't, the criteria in the social world that you're participating in, you should be able to say what it is. And this is important because um, if you just say, I'm just gonna write until I'm done, that's a continually receding horizon and you can never know if you're done with that. Um, Alice says, when I'm stuck so starting something, I write, dear writing buddy at the top of the page and start as if I'm just jotting ideas down to her. And usually it starts to turn into a proper paper without my noticing it. Do you want to say how you know when it's done? Um, it was be. I actually thought of this because of your point. It's usually when I realize I can't go on without her help. So uh -huh. usually I, I see, okay, what can I solve on my own and what do yeah. I need to take to her? And um, if 